morning. morning. How's everybody feeling today? I want to welcome you to the 2014 Africa Brain Trust. My name is Karen Bass. I'm a member of Congress representing a district in Los Angeles, and I am so proud and honored to be here with you this morning. And I think it was so fitting that we began this morning looking at a slideshow of President Mandela. And if you think about it and reflect for a moment, a year ago this time, we were all coming to grips with the fact that the world was preparing to lose Mandiba and uh, what has happened and what has transpired in our world over the last 12 months. And we wanted to begin with this slideshow and reflection on his life, because I think if anything, uh, as he left us last year, he left us with the responsibility to continue, to continue moving forward, to advance the continent, and from my perspective as a member of Congress, to do everything that I can to further, to strengthen, to build U.S. relations with the continent of Africa. So that is what we're here to do today. We are going to begin by reflecting on an absolute historic event that took place just a little over a month ago. Um, I want to uh, uh, take this opportunity to acknowledge that throughout the day, different members of Congress will be coming and going, and we will acknowledge them uh, when they come in members of the African Diplomatic Corps and our distinguished panelists and moderators. And I also want to especially thank the sponsor of today's Brain Trust, and that is Chevron. Chevron is a partner for us in this Brain Trust and has been throughout our work uh, on Africa over the last several years. As all of you know, as I mentioned in August of this year, President Obama, for the first time in US history, and it is kind of amazing that it was the first time in US history, welcomed nearly 50 African heads of state to Washington. How many people were here during that week? I hope that of the hands that were raised, and it looked like it was the majority, I hope that you were able to participate in one of the many, many events that took place during that week. It was exciting to be here because to me, uh, all of Washington was all Africa that week, and it was very exciting. The theme of the summit was investing in Africa's next generation, and the primary focus was in the areas of trade and investment, Africa's security, its democratic development, and its people. At its core, the summit was about fostering stronger ties between the United States and Africa. And so what we want to do today is we want to look back on the successes and the challenges of the summit during today's panel discussions. We want to highlight the perspectives of scholars, civil society, and members of the African diaspora. But we also, of course, want to look forward to what the summit means for the U.S.-Africa relationship and efforts to increase collaboration with African nations in the areas of capacity building, trade and investment, security and governance. And later in the day, we're also going to have the honor of hearing from the USAID administrator, Ra Shah, who will be able to highlight his agency's role in the Africa Summit, but also uh, given the crisis that's going on uh, with Ebola, we wanted to hear from him what the U.S. response will be. And so that will take place later on in the morning. Just a little bit about our format. We're going to have a, a keynote speaker that I will introduce in a minute. Um, and after the keynote, we will have a panel. The panel will react to the keynote's uh, presentation, and then we will open it up for Q&A. And as always in these forums, we like to allow plenty of time for your input. And we're going to do it in a way that might be a little different than you're used to. Number one, we're not going to force people to ask questions, because we know most of you don't want to ask questions. You have a statement you want to make. <laughs> and that's just fine. We just want you to make that statement quickly. No keynote speeches after the keynote speaker. <laughs> And then we're going to take multiple comments at a time, and then the moderator will ask one panelist to respond. That way, we will have plenty of time for your interaction and your input. And so we'll ask everyone to cooperate with that format. So now I have the distinct honor of introducing our keynote speaker. Ambassador Johnny Carson is going to provide an overarching assessment of the U.S.-Africa Summit and frame much of today's discussion. 
Ambassador Carson served as the Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of African Affairs from 2009 to 2013. Ambassador Carson's 37-year foreign service career includes ambassadorships to Kenya, Zimbabwe, and Uganda, as well as serving as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Africa Affairs. With a background including such broad and deep experience with African leaders and people, we look forward to hearing the Ambassador's keen insights on the U.S.-Africa Summit and the U.S.-Africa relationship going, abroad, going forward. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Johnny Carson. Congresswoman Bass and members of the Black Caucus, Thank you very, very much for inviting me here this morning to participate in your annual Brain Trust program and to share some thoughts on the recently concluded U.S.-Africa Summit. Although everyone in this room is focused on Africa today, we are all aware that over the past 12 months, this has been an extraordinarily difficult period for President Obama and his foreign policy team. The Russian destabilization of Ukraine, the emergence of the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, the bloody conflict between Israel and Hamas in the Gaza Strip, and the continued disintegration of Libya have frustrated the administration and presented enormous challenges to those responsible for America's foreign policy. There were many in Washington who predicted that the August U.S.-Africa summit would also come up short and become another of the administration's foreign policy casualties. Prior to the Washington gathering, skeptics claimed the summit was a tardy response to counter China's growing influence in Africa and that there would be no new major American initiatives on Africa to rival those that have come out of China over the past decade. Other critics speculated that many African leaders might not come to Washington because of the decision by the president not to hold bilateral meetings. Others thought that Washington, Washington would not get many African leaders because the president might end up scolding them on issues of governance and human rights. And some NGO groups thought the administration would avoid discussing the thorny issues related to democracy, human rights, and corruption. Many of these early assumptions were proven wrong. The summit was largely a success. It reaffirmed President Obama's commitment to Africa, and it highlighted the administration's key policy initiatives. And most significantly, it showcased the president's determination to encourage American companies to invest and trade in Africa's emerging markets. For those focused on the political and security issues, the president and his senior foreign policy advisors called again for greater adherence to democracy and governance and respect for human rights, including for lesbians and gays, and reassured African leaders that while the United States has no intention of militarizing Africa, it would partner with African nations to defeat the spread of terrorist groups 
who pose a threat to them as well as the international community. From the outset, the purpose of the summit was to strengthen and broaden America's longstanding historical and political ties to Africa, to highlight Africa's growing economic importance as a trade and investment destination for American corporations, and to spotlight the Obama administration's signature initiatives across Africa, including Power Africa, Feed the Future, Trade Africa, and its important new Young African Leaders Initiative. Although many common traders drew parallels with recent summits held by China, Turkey, Japan, uh, and the European Union, the administration went out of its way to underscore that the summit was not intended to be a high profile development or donor conference in which the United States would be announcing new programs and handing out large amounts of new money. From the beginning, the goals were to build a stronger, broader, and more comprehensive partnership with Africa and to change the image of the continent from one of hopelessness and continuing conflict to one of a dynamic and rapidly growing emerging market of 54 individual states with over 1 billion people. The summit took a big step toward achieving those key goals. African turnout for the summit was extraordinarily high, matching or eclipsing African representation at other recent summits in Japan, China, Turkey, and India. Presidents, vice presidents, and foreign ministers from 50 states came to Washington, some with delegations numbering at least 30 individuals. But equally important at this summit was the representation of Africa's growing business community. They turned out in large numbers as well, including some of the continent's most influential and successful corporate leaders. Nigeria's Aliko Dangote was here, along with Sudan's philanthropist Mo Ibrahim, Telecom's executive Strive Masaiwa, and South African Standard Bank Chief Executive Shem Shabalala, as well as many others. Summit discussions focused largely on three agenda items, trade and investment, security and stability, and good governance and transparency. The economic and business portion of the summit received the highest and greatest coverage and was probably the most innovative and successful aspect of the three-day event, largely because of the presence of so many American business leaders. Organized by Commerce Secretary Pritzker and former New York City Mayor Bloomberg, the trade and investment program brought some of America's most influential corporate and financial leaders together, many for the very, very first time with African presidents, finance ministers, and trade officials. In both formal and informal sessions, American investors and corporate leaders representing dozens of Fortune 500 companies explain the factors that go into their investment decisions while African leaders discuss trade and investment opportunities in their individual countries, as well as the business enhancing economic reforms that they have been implementing. No event like this 
has ever taken place before in Washington or the United States. And the administration used this economic program to reaffirm its strong support for the renewal of the African Growth and Opportunity Act in 2015 and to focus renewed attention on its Power Africa initiative first announced by President Obama during his July 2013 trip to Africa. Underscoring the administration's commitment to address Africa's enormous energy shortfall, President Obama announced a massive expansion of his initial effort, pledging some $300 million in new assistance to help boost Africa's electrical capacity to some 30,000 megawatts in the next five years. The administration's efforts were bolstered by strong support from the private sector, as well as renewed commitments from the World Bank. Security issues also received serious attention at the summit. With conflicts raging in several parts of Africa, including northern Nigeria, South Sudan, and the Central African Republic, African leaders were eager to engage on this topic. Administration officials reaffirmed the U.S. commitment to work with African countries to fight terrorist groups that threaten both African and American interests and to provide training, technical assistance, and material support to African militaries involved in the fight against AQIM and against Al-Shabaab in East Africa. To underscore America's commitment in the security arena, President Obama announced a new five-year, $100 million security governance initiative covering six African states, Kenya, Nigeria, Mali, Niger, Tunisia, and Ghana. Funds for this new program will be used to strengthen the capacity of these six states to counter transnational threats and to contribute to regional and international security. Democracy, good governance, and respect for human rights have been a key part of the President's policy on Africa for the past five and a half years. And although these issues received less media attention than others, they were not left off the agenda as NGOs and activists in both the United States and Africa feared. In a major speech at the United States Institute for Peace on the eve of the summit, the President's National Security Advisor, Ambassador Susan Rice, told that audience, and I quote, the United States cannot and does not try to dictate the choices of other nations but we are unabashed in our support for democracy and human rights. We will continue to invest in promoting democracy in Africa as elsewhere because over the long term, democracies are more stable, more peaceful, and they are better able to provide for their citizens." End quote. Secretary John Kerry echoed and expanded on that theme on the first day of the summit when he spoke to a gathering of civil society leaders. Secretary Kerry said, and I quote, respect for democracy, the rule of law, and human rights are not just American values, they are universal values, end quote. And like Ambassador Rice, Secretary Kerry also reiterated America's strong support for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights in America and across Africa, saying, and I quote, we will continue to stand up and speak out 
for LGBT activists who are working for the day when tolerance and understanding really do conquer hate, end quote. Although little information to date has surfaced about the contents of the many bilateral meetings hosted by Vice President Biden, Secretary Kerry, and Under Secretary for Political Affairs, Wendy Sherman, I'm rather confident that governance and human rights issues were probably included in many of those discussions. Vice President Biden's meeting with Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan almost certainly focused on Nigeria's struggle against Boko Haram, the government's ineffective security strategy across the North, and its inability thus far to bring home the Shabak girls. Given his past comments, Secretary Kerry probably discussed democracy and governance issues with President Kabila of the Democratic Republic of the Congo and several other leaders who were flirting with changing their constitutions. President Obama has consistently made a strong case for strengthening democratic institutions, uh, and he does not appear to have backed away from this during the summit. Although this summit was well organized and well attended, much, and I stress much, remains to be done to turn the goodwill and the long list of commitments and promises into reality. This will require persistent and sustained follow-up by administration officials in the White House and the State Department, as well as USAID and the Commerce Department. It will require the Congress to play a key oversight and legislative role and it will require the American business community to follow through on its newfound interest and commitments to Africa. Administration officials will have to maintain a strategic focus on summit objectives and not allow the implementation of key goals and objectives to slip or to be brushed aside as new crises and new priorities emerge. Some of that may be happening right now. The current Ebola crisis in West Africa is serious and must be addressed, but it must not be allowed to suck the oxygen out of the administration's other important policy initiatives in Africa. Nor should the Ebola crisis in the three West African states be an excuse for American companies to stop exploring potential opportunities in one of Africa's other 51 nation states. Looking ahead, this is what I think should be done. The administration has to follow through on its promise to secure a seamless renewal of the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Congressional support for this will be required and the administration needs to start now to work with both houses of Congress to muster the required votes for the extension of this legislation in 2015. AGOA is America's most important trade legislation and a failure to secure timely renewal of this law will undermine American, Amer African confidence uh, in America's economic commitments to the continent. The administration should work with the Congress to secure long-term reauthorization and support of the Export-Import Bank. 
although XM's responsibilities are global, many of America's major companies working in Africa look to the bank to provide funding and financial assistance to close deals. This is particularly true of companies like Boeing, GE, and Caterpillar. The administration needs to create a small cell and formally designate a senior official at the State Department to serve as coordinator for the implementation of the summit agenda. Although the NSC played an important and key role in organizing the summit, the responsibility for follow-up should be mainstreamed and moved into the bureaucracy. If coordination remains a White House function, there is a good possibility that a change of administration in the future or a change in key personnel there will result in a collapse of support and interest in achieving some of the summit's multi-year goals and objectives. The Congress should ensure that the promises and commitments of additional personnel and resources to staff commercial attache positions and sub-regional trade hubs around Africa are carried out. All too often, there are commitments for new attaches who go into place for a short period of time and then are withdrawn. The Congress must maintain oversight on this. More importantly, the Congress should ask the administration to prepare a comprehensive matrix of summit commitments and to report back on a once yearly or a twice yearly basis on what has been achieved. Currently, there appears to be no overall matrix of the commitments and promises made by the government or those made by the private sector or any clear indication of which department, agency, or company will be carrying them out. Congress should pay particular attention to the implementation and the evolution of the administration's key economic development programs, particularly Power Africa, Trade Africa, and doing business in Africa. Power Africa appears to be off to a strong start, supported by congressional legislation and summit announcements of new support from the business community and the administration. But if Power Africa is to succeed, more effort will be needed to encourage major American power companies to look at investment opportunities in and across Africa. As follow-up to the summit, the White House should de designate a senior official to be the Power Africa Czar in Washington. This program requires more than just a mid-level coordinator based at our embassy in Pretoria. In addition, the Departments of State, Commerce, and Energy should begin planning a new energy trade mission to Africa, drawing in such major companies as Duke Energy, Constellation Energy, Florida Power and Light, Wisconsin Power and Light, all of whom I think are major players in the energy sector here and who were not a part of the summit. The Department of Commerce should re-energize and expand its Doing Business in Africa program across the United States. One summit will not change corporate attitudes uh, in America towards Africa. Encouraging American companies to take note of the American marketplace will require a sustained and high visibility effort. Until the arrival of Secretary Pritzker uh, about a year ago at the Commerce Department, activities there 
on trade uh, and uh, development with uh, Africa were sometimes spotty and uneven. State, commerce, and US ID should expand the Trade Africa initiative beyond the countries of the East African community to include at least one other sub-regional African economic grouping, either SADAC uh, or ECOWAS. And finally, the Africa Bureau at the State Department will remain the principal focal point of U.S. engagement in Africa and likely the principal driver of policy in both the political and economic arena, much as it has been for the last 30 or 40 years. To help achieve some of the lofty summit goals in the economic and commercial area, the Congress should consider authorizing a modest $200,000 a year annually for the next five years to the Africa Bureau to enlarge its economic and commercial staff so that it can organize annual trade missions of Afri American companies to Africa each year in advance of the AGOA summit meetings. The U.S.-Africa summit, in my estimation, was a tremendous success. But to ensure that the summit's success will have a lasting impact, and not just a historical one, oversight will be required, and some of the recommendations I have just outlined will have to be implemented. Thank you for your considerations. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Raymond Gilpin, I'm the Academic Dean at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies at the National Defense University, and I'll be moderating uh, this first panel. Um, taking a cue from um, Congresswoman Bass's comment about there not being keynote addresses after the keynote address, we're going to keep the panel here on the on, on the MDIs and not at the podium so that we'll be able to engage a lot more with you because I know that um, we have a lot of, um, uh, we have a wealth of experience not just on this side of the microphones but on the other side. And so we'll try and keep it as informal and flowing as possible. We have a very um, packed program today. There will not be breaks between the sessions and um, you'll notice that um, one panel will, will, would, um, would uh, morph uh, seamlessly into the next. Let me start by uh, thanking Congresswoman Bass for um, organizing this event and also for her stalwart leadership on Afri U.S. African issues. Um, thanks also, also to her staff who have worked tirelessly to make this happen. Um, we also appreciate um, Ambassador Carson's um, remarks, um, not just um, compre comprehensive and insightful, but he did give us a list of um, practical doables that would help us think through how, as he said, we could translate the um, goodwill that the um, summit garnered um, over its um, duration into effects that would not only change the, the, the dynamics of U.S.-Africa relations, but would also change the uh, fortunes of Africa's uh, 54 uh, nations. This panel is appropriately titled, A Deeper Engagement with Africa, Moving Beyond the Summit. And I think um, we couldn't have asked for a better leader than um, Ambassador um, Carson's remarks in this regard. Um, this particular event is also timely, um, not just because it helps us sustain the momentum, but also helps to focus us on the huge task that lies ahead. We've all um, seen a lot of commentary that seemed to emerge from the um, summit, um, a lot of post-mortems uh, and uh, we and um, uh, analysis, and I think they tended to gravitate around three simple questions. Why now? What's different? And who benefits? 
Um, you don't agree with me that African countries are at a strategic juncture. While the challenges do remain, we still have conflict, we still have poverty, we still have corruption, we still have capacity issues. I think that um, opportunities do abound. And for African countries who seem to be at the vanguard of economic growth globally and who are showing a wealth of potential, demographics uh, um, suggesting a growth not just quantitatively but qualitatively of the African market, I think it's an appropriate time for us to be reconsidering how we engage with the countries. So after the wine now, I think the strategic juncture gives us some insights. What's different? Um, Ambassador Carson laid it out uh, brilliantly. We're now focusing less on patronage, more on partnerships. We're focusing less on a uh, focus on the public sector and how do we engage the emerging and vibrant private sector. And we're also thinking creatively about how to um, use the wealth of um, resources and engagement um, instruments that we have beyond the usual humanitarian and security to include trade, growth, equality, and equity. So what's different? I think those are three major differences. Um, who benefits? I, some people have described it as a win-win for Africa and the United States. But I think that if you look at the core of the three key issues that um, Ambassador Carson outlined, you would see that it focuses almost exclusively on the security and the prosperity of the African citizens. So who benefits or who should benefit, I think the answer to that question is the um, African citizen. And a lot of the initiatives seem to be aligned in that direction. But we have to, as Ambassador Carson said, translate all this goodwill into reality. And to do this, we have, I'm very honored to have a very distinguished panel who would lead off. You have their bios and your materials, so I wouldn't read those. Um, but it suffice to say I'll just give a very um, brief um, introduction. Um, first, we have Dr. Monde Muyangwa, who directs the Africa program at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Mwangi Kimenyi, who directs the African Growth Initiative and is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Thank you for joining us. And third, we have Mr. Dote Ekwe, who is a managing director for government relations for Amnesty International USA. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay. Um, we're going to try and keep the um, panel and the panel structure very simple and interactive. Um, uh, Initially, I'm going to invite each um, panelist to introduce themselves to institutions and give their initial reactions to um, Ambassador Carson's um, remarks. Um, I'm going to, we're going to give them three to four minutes each to do this. And then we'll have a brief conversation amongst ourselves and then we'll open it to Q&A. But before I invite um, Dr. Muyangwa, to um, lead off, I'm going to ask you all to join me in something I call something I call silencing the electronics ceremony. <laughs> if it sings, buzzes, rings, or vibrates, um, could we um, please um, turn them off? Um, not just um, out of um, respect for our panelists and your colleagues, but because they do tend to interfere with the electronics. So let's just take a quick minute to um, silence them, and I'll ask um, Dr. Miyangwa to go first. Thank you, Dr. Gilpin, and thank you, Congressmember Bass, for inviting us here. I don't know why I'm here because Ambassador Carson just covered everything I was going to talk about. So I, I think I'll start off by detailing everything that um, Ambassador Carson uh, raised in his keynote. But I thought I should go back to the issue of the significance of the summit. I think we cannot underestimate the symbolism of what this summit meant, both uh, in Africa and here in the United States. First summit in 50 years since African countries gained their independence. It sent a very powerful signal, not just to Africa, but to the rest of the world as well. 
especially since the United States has held similar summits with other regions but Africa. So the power of that symbol, that signal, should not be underestimated. Secondly, that it happened on the watch of President Obama should also not be underestimated. Those factors and the, key, the, the, the factor that Dr. Gilpin raised about Africa's um, emerging strategic importance, I think the confluence of those three factors really puts this uh, summit in a key position in the history of US-Africa relations. So I think that's really, um, really important. I know there are those who focus on the fact that the United States was playing catch up, that China, Japan, the European Union, that all held summits with Africa, and the United States had never done that. This is true. We cannot shy away. So in that sense, the summit was long overdue. But having said that, the fact that it happened, and that it happened this year, at this point, when Africa is emerging globally, is powerful and it's important and it is something that we can build on. The second issue that I want to talk about is uh, the issue of implementation. The summit as an event, very successful. Even for those of us who were able to get only into a few of the official events, but participated in many of uh, the sideline events. But as Ambassador Carson mentioned, we cannot stop here. The real success of the summit will be determined by follow-up implementations and concrete deliverables. And that's what we need uh, to focus on. And since this is a Congressional uh, Black Caucus event, I thought I would just highlight some of the things that need to happen uh, from our end. A key issue for me is addressing what I call the diplomatic void. The fact that so many African ambassadors or US ambassadors to Africa have been stuck waiting for confirmation sends absolutely contradicts the message that we were trying to uh, show during the summit, that Africa is important. How can it be important if the top presidential representative on the continent in the countries is not there to follow up, to engage, to do the business of the nation. I know we've made progress over the last few uh, weeks in the sense that some of these uh, US ambassadors have been confirmed, but to wait 400 days as some of them have waited, we are not serious when we do that. <coughs> It's not just the toll that it takes on our relationships with the countries that are waiting for political and diplomatic representation. It's also the toll that it takes on these career diplomats who want to do nothing more than serve their countries, and yet they and their families are stuck in limbo. But long term, what impact is it having on the next generation of American diplomats? when they see this political game being played with our diplomacy abroad. I think that's an issue that we need to pay more attention to. The second issue, oops, I'm already over time. All right, so I will jump to my third issue. I think for me, one of the, um, I don't want to say disappointment, but I think an area where we could have done better with this summit was highlighting and putting on record African commitments to this new relationship that we're trying to develop. I mean, this whole summit was about setting a different tone and tenor in our engagement with Africa. And yet, all of the commitments to me seem to come from the US side. It would have been nice to get a few African commitments on the table, as this is what we bring to the table. And yet, that aspect was not as um, was not highlighted enough for me anyhow. And I think there was the areas where that could have been done. One, specifically addressing the governance issue. We could, for instance, have tied the African commitment to doing more with the African peer review mechanism to improve governance on the continent. We can do all this trade and investment, but if governance and the rule of law do not exist, all of that is going to go down the drain. 
And so I think tying it to the African peer review governments and enhancing governance and rule of law on the continent would have been a good African commitment to bring to the table. They're already doing it. But the fact that only 35 African countries are members of the peer review mechanism for me is quite troubling. And the fact that African countries have to invite the peer review mechanism to come in and review them is another troubling aspect. Make it mandatory. Make it mandatory. I think another area where Africans could have brought something to the table, and this is my last point, Dr. Gilpin, don't send me a note, <laughs> is linking this summit to the goals that the African Union has articulated in Agenda 2063. I think there was enough there to complement what the US was bringing to the table with what Africans were bringing to the table to really set a different framework and tone to the future of US-Africa relations. And with that, I will stop. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Miangwa. You made a number of uh, very um, interesting points um, relating to the diplomatic uh, void, um, which is crucial, not just from a mes messaging perspective, but also from, from an implementation perspective. Um, at your last point about um, the governance issue and what African people, African people and governments bring to the table is also very, very pertinent, um, particularly because a lot of the narrative of the summit was around partnerships. And partnerships include two parties. Yeah. And I think it is slightly asymmetrical for us to leave um, claiming um, unqualified or qualified victory if we're only looking at one side of the equation. And so I think that's also a very important point and uh, bring um, Mr. Kimieni in um, for his opening remarks. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, moderator, for the opportunity. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Representative Bass for inviting uh, me to this event and uh, to Ambassador Carson uh, for a very good summary of uh, the events uh, of, the, of the summit. I thought it was very uh, lucid, and obviously that uh, removes a lot of what uh, we can add. But. I can say in summary, I think Abazada is right about, uh, you know, skeptics, uh, particularly us in the think tank community. And if we don't do that, uh, question issues, uh, raise particular concerns, I, I think we will not be doing our job. So I think we did engage. Uh, in a bit of that, uh, looking at... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I think someone, someone, someone's trying to turn their phone off. Could you do that for us, please? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, 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 so we there are very many. A lot of the uh, the think tanks in Washington did raise some questions, uh, and I would say that uh, uh, personally, also had uh, particular issues, uh, particularly relating to even from the African side, how how prepared are they, uh, how effective would they be, and of course there was always the fear uh, of what Ambassador Carson talked about: would this be a man monologue? Uh, I think everybody was concerned, you know, we have all these 50 leaders, they are sitting uh, with one president, you know, how much of a dialogue would be effective. So I, I, I think it's good to question some of these things. But let me say, basically, uh, that from uh, someone in the think tank community, from the, an African perspective, I thought this was revolutionary. Uh, it was indeed a uh, real success. It was courageous on the part of the president and his administration. Uh, and it's, it's probably not something that we may not have seen without President Obama. So in that respect, I think we have to really congratulate the president for the courage, because it's not the type of, uh, uh, there's a timer there already. Uh, it, yeah, it's not the type of thing that you see very uh, frequently. Um, and uh, so, so that is a big point in, in itself. We could have talked about uh, the Korean one, the EU one, but let's talking about the US and the circumstances, this was great. Okay, let me, let me just make a few uh, points. One is that every time we have these events, uh, you could also, well, let me say first of all, the media, the US media was terrible. Okay, uh, if you if you compared, 
in, in terms of our analysis, if you compare even media in China, in media in EU, the American media, I think, I think the biggest topic was uh, Ebola infected summit. Okay, uh, and, and this was not uh, the type of thing that you would expect. So it was not a very good thing for the media. But anyway, before we can always find criticisms after an event, you you always find something. So what I did, I'll go back to my, and this will be supporting Ambassador Carson. I wrote something on July 30th before the summit. I said, let's say what will be the indicators of success so that after the summit, we can come back and say, this is what we expected and this is what we got. I had four of them and, and Ambassador Carson covered all of them. One, for a successful summit, we need a tangible, plan of action and commitments. We got that. I mean, there are clear commitments. We may differ a bit on what was the African side, but it's clear there were fun commitments, particularly with the business community. There were deals that were made. If you talk to the business leaders, if you talk to the presidents, we got that. That was my indicator of success, number one. Number two was we needed to see effective and coherent participation of the African leaders. In other words, we didn't want them here to come and get a lecture. And I think it was good to state that explicitly, that uh, you, you, know, you can do this with a video link, but you know, and get a lecture. You come, you need to have a coherent positions, you need to be effective. And I talked to some of the presidents, and I think we can say this was not a monologue. It was not uh, one-sided from the president, President Obama. It was a discussion. So to me, entering that level uh, is very important. Okay? It's very important to have that exchange. And most presidents did feel that they were actually involved. And they also came with coherent positions. OK, one minute. The other one was, would the summit uh, a, a key uh, uh, success factor was alignment with African development priorities? And if you go back, look there, look at the commitments, look at the issues of development, look at the issue of trade, look at the issue of uh, security, you find that this aligned to African development uh, priorities. So again, that's uh, uh, an important factor. So I, I have two more. The other one, I think, which may be challenged, is from unilateralism to multilateralism. In other words, Agoa, which is, I agree, and it need to be pushed. Agoa is pretty much a gift by the US government to, uh, to, to Africans. It's not something you really negotiate, or now there's more room to, to negotiate and uh, talk to uh, Representative Bass and tell them what the Africans want. But it's really a gift from 2000. We are going to give you these preferences. We need to move from there. And this is what we are looking for, uh, you know, more looking at benefits. So I disagree a bit with my colleagues about benefits to Africa from this summit. It's, there's mutualism. Uh, the trade is always mutual. If you expand trade, if you expand investment, uh, security issues. So to me, uh, this creation of a mutual relationship did evolve, finally. And this is very key to me, and uh, Ambassador Carson has talked about it. Having a summit one time without institutions for sustainability, do not really make a lot of sense. And uh, um, so my final point was an uh, indicator of success was we want to see institutionalization for sustainability. We want to make sure that post Obama, we can continue with this. And uh, going through, uh, if you read Obama, uh, President Obama's summary of what was achieved, he actually hit on all my points. I was very happy. All these points were in the speech, including sustainability, you know, institutionalization, and mutualism, and all that. So I was very happy. So broadly, I agree with this as a major success. And we look forward to moving forward uh, in a sustainable way. And thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, your point about sustainability and also the what you call mutuality, mutuality uh, really um, pertinent. I think the messaging issue is also one that is important uh, because for us to um, be able to get a, a number of the um, changes and the congressional action that uh, both the keynote speaker and the panelists are mentioning, we do need to have a lot more sensitization here domestically about what it's all about and what the stakes are and the mutuality. So thank you so much, thank um, you. Mr. Ekwe. Uh, thank you. I'd like to also uh, uh, reiterate the thanks to Congresswoman Bath and Ambassador Carson. Um, I wish we could clone the both of you so that we could have a more vigorous and um, progressive of foreign policy towards the African continent. Um, as a representative of the difficult issues, um, I have a role here, to, even beyond my colleagues' think tank role, to, to sort of make, raise the awkward questions. Um, and I, I, and I, I would, I, I'd like to start by saying that we, we, it may have been just in August, but we, we need to move away from the, his, the starry-eyed analysis of the of the conference, which was historic in nature but not in content. In, in other words, until we get the follow-up that Ambassador Carson and all of my colleagues have have raised, um, it was an important and first conference, and that was it. And and we can, we we in this room cannot allow that to happen. So we we, we need to make sure that this is a historic conference, uh, a summit that leads to sustainable major change, and that is going to be, um, I think, dependent on not only the development of institutions here in the United States, not only on the clarity of firm commitments by the African governments that are half of this challenge and half of this initiative, um, not only on Congress. Um, being convinced to actually invest more money in democracy and human rights programs and governance and rule of law programs as opposed to more military programs um, and also on um, various administrations beyond the current one making a, um, a, a more genuine, genuine and vigorous challenge about the rule of um, yeah. the rule of law and human rights. So we we, we, we have uh, the, the the best I think um, evaluation I can say came from uh, Dr. Munyangwa, who who said we have to wait and see what happens, but we have to make sure that the best happens. So that that's my first comment. Um, the second, uh, which is really follow up, follow up, follow up. And I would argue that in addition, we need to actually push to make sure that this was not a one off event. It took a long time, it took a lot of resources, but this has to be a sustained dialogue between the United States and the African governments. It doesn't need to be at the head of state level, but it needs to be at a senior level, and it needs to happen annually at least. Um, that is where you're going to be able to not only measure implementation and progress, but you're also going to prevent backsliding, um, which is always a risk. My second um, point would be um, about the missing guests. Um, there, the, prior to the, 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 the summit, a number of groups were worried that this was going to be a, um, well, at worst, it was going to be a, a big photo op, and then, then um, probably at best, it was going to be a dialogue between governments. Um, and maybe that's what a summit is supposed to be, except we have a, um, a fundamental problem in that in too many African countries, the, 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 the discussion of investment and of trade and of rule of law is a monologue. There is no dialogue because civil society, political opposition are not only having their ability to free expression, association and assembly curtailed, they are having it violently curtailed. Now, there may be um, a sense that, well, the African governments are representative, but where they, they are not the only stakeholder in what happens in those countries. And, there's a, and, and until we can change that, that equation of not seeing critics and think tanks or human rights groups as threats um, who also have potentially interesting um, 
uh, ideas to solutions or solutions to problems. Um, Africa is, is these African countries are always not going to be getting the most out of their own population. And at worst, they're going to be having destabilization, they're going to have conflicts, and they're not going to have democratic environments that would attract investment, which is what seems to have been the priority of the conference. So the, the, while many may, may be questioning why there was so much of the NGO community that was raising a fuss about civil society not being invited or not being officially invited, the side events I think were extremely exciting, but they were side events. In fact, there was probably more dialogue between them and the US government than there was between them and African governments. And that is what that is what is unfortunately too much of the case. I know my time is up. I'll stop here and just say that, um, you know, they're, 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 I may have sounded harsh, but this is, this is how we get better. Africans deserve better. They, they can do better. African governments can be pushed to do better. And it's actually in the benefit of the United States to see that improvement also. I'll stop there. No, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ekwe. I would uh, disagree. I don't think you are harsh. I think you are very constructive. Um, uh, because if, if, if we're going to make progress, we're going to have to take a long, hard, dispassionate look, not just at what we intend to do, but A, but a how we do it, and B, how we measure progress. That's one thing we haven't talked about a lot on the panel as yet. How do we know we're moving in the right direction? Um, uh, we are going to move um, directly to uh, Q&A. And um, be in the interest of time, we're going to take um, uh, sets of questions. We have three microphones um, at the um, head of each aisle. I'll ask you to line up behind the microphones. Um, as you see, um, we lead by example. The panelists have not made speeches, so please do not make a speech. Um, please introduce yourself. Start by introducing yourself. Um, if you could keep your comments to a minute, a minute and a half, you will see there are many people behind you who will be able to take as many comments as possible and then um, pose those to the panelists. Um, we'll start on my left and take one each and then uh, turn to the panel, sir. So. Good morning. Uh, my name is Germa Alaro. My profession is I'm a professional engineer in Washington. And uh, I used to be the director of construction building inspection for the city of Baltimore. I used to be the chief engineer for Washington. Now, uh, the first thing is I was looking about the topic, African brainstorm. It's really a very interesting topic. When I, when I look at uh, the African summits, I'm just analyzing what our president has done. What is really the most... The most important, I was not in, 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 in uh, Washington, I was out of the Washington, but it was really a very interesting thing, what, I, what came to my mind. It is the summation of understanding of the universe of the, our president, and bringing that summit to the USA was very positive. And in that sense, I think about the history of the USA from Du Bois to Obama, and that seminar will define the history of uh, how we can go forward. Africa can be defined as, from 1960, the African Union to, uh, from Af uh, Organization of African Union to African, uh, uh, to AU today, it is a positive progress. But in, sir, in the interest of time, could I appeal for a question or a comment, please? The, the question, the question uh, to, to get to the question. Okay, I'll yes. come directly to the question. Thank you. When, when, when really anal I, I look at, uh, as an African, the African history, the missing element to me is one and one alone. Africa is moving on the right direction. But the direction that needs to be improved is the democratization of Africa 
should be number one. We have to work on that. Thank you very much, sir. Madam. I would just like, um, oh, Mojuba Olufunke Okome, and I teach political science at Brooklyn College. Um, I would like clarification on how Agoa is a gift to Africa. But my real question is about governance and the importance of security. Um, I come from Nigeria, and we have Boko Haram running rampage. We have almost 300 girls. The Nigerian government can't even tell us how many they are missing. We have commitment from governments all over the world that they would help to rescue the girls. They're still missing. The only ones found are the ones who rescued themselves. So what kind of governance do we have when citizens are missing, the world is looking by, and it seems like nobody cares? Thank you, ma'am. Sir. My name is Yaya Fanusi. I'm with the United States of Africa 2017 project. I would suggest next time you have on the panel at least someone who Forbes ranking estimate have at least $50 million worth of assets inside Africa. Because most of you guys are irrelevant to what needs to be done in Africa. Thank you. <laughs> we'll take one from the lady right there. Yes. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Please. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Ivy K. Pendleton, and I was the spokeswoman for the South Sudan referendum for the world's newest country, the Republic of South Sudan, in the United States. And my and I also am the on the board of directors for the United Nations Women. So I work primarily in Africa for uh, the civil society and the NGO society. My question is: is how can the United States overall? Um, develop partnership and private sector development in a way that is transparent, that facilitates or incentivizes these partnerships with the civil society so that businesses can know about the opportunities to actually facilitate business in Africa and help grow the economy, not only the U.S. and in Africa. I mean, the lack of participation from the private sector or the lack of invitation um, for many of these individuals that work in Africa all of the time was limited at the summit. And and, um, and with the upcoming and pending World Bank meetings, I think that this conversation and dialogue can be continued in terms of economic uh, sustainability. So, Thank you very much, ma'am. Take one more. It's Arnold King. On a business consultant. And I'd like to know uh, what is a, uh, effective economic growth in Africa, in Africa? Because there's three African countries that are shut down because the disease called Ebola and had an effect on our economic growth and everything else. I mean, and there are other factors too. I mean, if nothing is done about it, then business economic growth Africa is, is never going to uh, happen and uh, everybody will never do business in Africa until these things are solved. Thank you very much. And last question before we turn to the panel. Uh, I have a question about the this is a form, part of the Black Caucus. Uh, in the U.S., the government of the U.S., there's some checks and balances. And the question was asked, why now? What's the difference? And who benefits? Well, why now is China is why now. What's the difference? China is the difference. And who benefits? Sure. That's a good question. <laughs> you, 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 but, you, you got me there. But, <laughs> but, 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 China, China does not have this form of government. China, China implements its policies unilaterally and carries them out. Now, because we're in this forum, which is a offshoot of the Black Caucus, the president must act in conjunction with the Congress. So the president held a summit 
that I don't think was approved by the Congress. Now, why did he do that? Because he's courageous, as our friend said. And he's Kenyan. That's right, <laughs> Kenyan. His name is Obama, isn't it? So my question, my question is, realistically, realistically, can this government act in a way which other governments act? Thank you very much. I think we've had, uh, you know, really re uh, a breadth of issues. And um, if I could just summarize them for the panelists, I'm going to ask you to be very brief. Two minutes each. Um, there's one on democratization and governance and government type and how we could make sure that that um, part of the partnership is as effective as it should be. Second, general one on the economic and business um, participation, what their role is in ensuring that we uh, move this agenda forward and uh, probably include the um, Agoa question as well. I think that was specifically directed to Mr. Um, Akwe. And then thirdly, um, how do we sustain this? Um, we're talking about partnerships. We need partnerships here in the United States as well between the White House and Capitol Hill. How do we sustain this? Um, I'll start on my um, far left with Mr. Akwe and work our way up. Just very brief two minute interventions. Sure. The, I think the, the, um, I'll start off with the uh, issue of um, the foreign policy one, which is actually the, the key vehicle for all of the other um, issues. Um, this has to be a constituency that is matched and built on across the United States. That then has to be effective and organized and put pressure on the U.S. Congress and educate the U.S. Congress outside of the members of the Black Caucus, of course, who don't need that, um, to basically change the marginalization and perception of Africa as a disaster source um, to a partner source, to an opportunity source as, a, as an equal with the caveat that you have expectations of accountability in Africa as well as here. There's a lot of stuff that I didn't get to here because I didn't have enough time. Um, the, I think the, the, the issue of democratization, that, that really is, that was one of the issues that was skirted on. And that, that's, that's not unique to this summit because dialogue between heads of states always has to be done in an, an appropriate manner. But at least we were able to raise the questions outside the summit. There was no silence. You can't raise questions about democracy in a couple of countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And unfortunately, a lot more of them are adopting laws that further curtail questions, discussion, accountability. If we don't actually fight that trend, Everything that want that we want to come out of this summit and of the relationship is at risk. Thank you very much, Mr. Kimani. Kimani? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, so I think uh, in maybe a broad of a, a statement about the, uh, the about the summit and consequences. I think I see this summit first of all as a turning point in the U.S. Africa relationship, but there is a difference between a a turning point and a tipping point. And I think the big issues is how do you move from this turning point to a tipping point? So you make it more durable and all that. I think those are issues that have been talked about. Uh, I'll comment on, on, on the other issue of democratization. I think we are quite critical of democracy in Africa. But uh, we need to look at where we are coming from. I would say that if you look at when Ambassador Carson was uh, uh, in Kenya, uh, several years back, I uh, was also there. And uh, look at where we have come from in most of Africa. Not just by having democratic elections, but what's happening at the grassroots, looking at decentralization efforts, looking at the issue of civil society, looking at the voice. I think there have been major improvements, but that doesn't mean we haven't gotten there. What I think we look at is where we are going. I think the Wilson Center has a map on uh, democratic movement. We have one coming up on the uh, democratic transitions and the, and the gains. We have the Mo Ibrahim Index on showing what's happening on governance. And what you find is that there are a lot of improvements. I mean, before, you couldn't say anything about the president of Kenya. I mean, now you got switch on talk radio. And everybody is bashing everybody else. The voice space, space in terms of voice, has increased. So we need to go not looking at the national 
but look at uh, what's happening at the local levels and look at what community groups are doing. That's the democracy. There is a lot of state failure, even in like in Nigeria, but I've just been working in communities in Nigeria where, you know, like even in the Delta, you look at a community and what the community is doing in terms of uh, development efforts and, and you find there's more democratic space. So we, we need to push it to add more. Let me talk finally about Agua because that a question, we deal with this. Why is it a gift? I think we need to, uh, so quickly, Agoa means you can bring 6,400 products to the United States, duty free and quarter free. There are no limits on quantities, there are no limits on, and you don't pay anything, there are no duties. Now, you don't get such a preference in many cases. In fact, it's something I'm going to WTO meetings now uh, from here. In, in Geneva, and we are trying to talk about how does all this fit with the, the WTO rules, and you know, what do you do about it? If you look at since Agoa, and remove the, the oil, I know many people are critical because a lot of it has oil. Look at the non-oil exports. You find that there has been a dramatic jump, and if you go to the sectors, textiles, uh, and other areas, you find that these are benefited in terms of profit reduction and in terms of employment, particularly for women, uh, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurs and, and workers. So to me, uh, a duty-free, quota-free access to the American market is important, and that's why we need to be very careful how it is renewed, because the, the big talk is now we want to go to a reciprocal uh, arrangement, which could be quite uh, disastrous. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. First of all, let me com confirm to my brother over there that I don't have 50 million. Uh, <laughs> but perhaps <laughs> the other, no, but. We're going to work on it. Yeah, I'll work on it. No, but uh, seriously, I, I get the point that you're making. But I would also say that from my perspective, change also coming comes from those who feel it here. You know? Money is important, money does help, but it is the ordinary Africans, the ordinary Americans, the ordinary citizens who feel the need to do something, no matter how much money they have. Those are the people who are going to bring about change. So I get you, I hear you, but I think that's another panel. I happen to agree uh, with my sister here who talked about the governance deficit. It is a key issue, and I think all of the panelists here have, have, have talked about it. Um, one point that I would make in addition to everything that uh, the others have made in, in terms of you know, making sure we keep pushing on the governance and rule of law issues, making sure that we empower people at the, at the grassroots level, I would also say that perhaps we also need to revisit our engagement on this governance issue. And two points that I would raise. One, I think up till now we have tended to measure or look at democracy in terms of elections. We need to focus a little bit more on what happens in between elections, particularly as it pertains to building democratic institutions. We currently have on the continent about five or six presidents who've been in power for over 30 years. I could be wrong about this, but I always think that the longer you stay in office, the less the chances of building those democratic institutions. And so that's an issue we definitely need to uh, address. So that's one point. I think a second point that we need uh, to look at is how other international actors are engaging with Africa on this governance issue. China comes to mind. They have typically not wanted to engage on the governance issue. What does that mean for our engagement? Do we need to recalibrate how we engage on this issue to minimize the impact that China may be having on this governance and rule of law issue? Can we work with the Chinese? I know that is really a bad thing to say in this town about working with the Chinese, but we do have to look at some of the things that the Chinese are doing in Africa, where there's room for cooperation, where they're actually undermining some of the uh, principles that we want to um, uphold, and then see how we need to recalibrate our entry on those issues. Thank you very much, Dr. Mayangwa. Um, thank you. Um, we have time for another round of questions, but I'm going to take as many questions as we can fit up to 551, 552.
and then we'll have to turn to the panel. Start on this side this time. Sir. Uh, Gilbert Mondela from uh, DRC. One of uh, China is big, we know. But the advantage that America has is that we are here. And many Africans want to be Americans versus Africans who want to be Chinese. You don't find them. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a strong and deep-rooted relationship with America because our brothers are here. We are one. Like it or Thank not, you. we are one. Thank you. One of the key instruments that America has is Exim Bank and OPIC. Ambassador Carson pointed out that uh, it is uh, Boeing, uh, Caterpillar, and the biggest one that are using these entities to move forward into Africa. Where are the black people here? Where are the black businesses that could be matching with African businesses. In this summit, it seemed like there were no African-American CEO. It seemed like, the, excuse me. <laughs> OK, excuse me. Thank you. In the summit, there were no interaction with Africans here, uh, yeah. African-American CEO mm -hmm. that could come and show that there is capacity, there is also knowledge and experience for African, African Americans to bring to Africa. Okay, I'm going to have to stop you here in the interest of time. One so more, one, just one quick one, it, which, which is critical. The issue of security. Okay, so that's, the, that's the critical issue. Yeah. Sir, thank you very much, sir. Madam. <laughs> Gina Falu, president of Falu Foundation that deals with economic development in black communities, and also former chair of the African Union Diaspora Task Team here in the United States. And my uh, main point is that um, Africa uh, added the diaspora as a sixth region of Africa, and the descendants here here in United States really were not included in the summit agenda determination and official participation in many of the events. And we want to make sure that for the uh, future, the follow up uh, does include very specifically and, and critically in economic development, especially manufacturing, because we could approve AGOA, but if the countries cannot produce the product and are exporting raw material, which is what has been happening, we are not helping very much of make a reality the AGOA objective for all the countries in Africa. So that's critical, and the question is, how can we do that? Thank, Thank you, you very much, ma'am. Sir. Hello, my name is Emeka Anyadiegu. I'm the founder of the African EDP.com, and I want to ask about technology trade and how will American businesses come to Africa and trade with technology give us actual ownership of the means of production to factories so we can become self-reliant and do things for ourselves. And also, I want to know, last weekend there was a big climate change March in New York and around the world. So I want to know what you think about renewable energy and Africa's future, such as solar panels and wind panels as well. Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Reverend Dr. Angelique Walker-Smith from Bread for the World. <clears throat> Excuse me, Christian organization advocating to end hunger and poverty here and abroad and with a particular concern with Africa. My question has to do with the role of the religious community in the civic conversation in terms of civil society. What role do you see religion and particularly the matter of faith and culture playing in these conversations, particularly when we talk about democratization and entrepreneurship? What is its role and what do you see as the outcome of this conversation? conversation with the faith leaders at the summit. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Sir? Yes, my name is Lafayette Barnes. I'm a part of the Mayor's Commission on African Affairs here in Washington, D.C. My question responds to the comment made about uh, terrible media coverage for the summit. My wife has a newspaper called the Washington Informer. It's part of the National Black Newspaper Publishers Association. She applied for uh, press credentials like many other black press and press in the African diaspora, but they couldn't get access. Yes, they did get credentials, but they couldn't get to the policy forms. They ended up staged, being staged, you know, 100 feet behind where the actual events were happening. So I'm, I'm here to, on behalf of the, black, of the black press to say that in the future when we have our 
one year or quarterly or follow-up meetings to measure the success of the summit, that we do a better job making sure that the press, particularly the black press, is there. Why? Because the black press, as you know, will tell the correct story, but they need to have access. So Thank I'm hoping that the planners will listen to that and take that under consideration. Thank you very much. Sir. My name is Jacqueline Neba. I am a research associate for the Public International Law and Policy Group. Um, my question is regarding the youth. Um, what steps have been taken to engage the youth to, um, to achieve some of the goals that have been set by the summit? Thank you. We have time for just three more brief questions, and we'll take one from each side. I do apologize to those who've waited patiently, but we really have run out of time. So this side, please. Yes, my name is Enoch Entry. I am founder of the One Life Society, engaging young entrepreneurial African youth that are serious about starting businesses in Africa. And my question is, what is the United States doing in order to control France intervening in African affairs. We talk about democracy, we talk about all this talk about good business, good governance. However, our own allies are controlling a lot of dictators in Africa. Thank you. Se um, secondly, we, we, ju we just have one oh, question. Okay. All right, thank you. Time. Yes, briefly, Lori Fitzpagato, uh, partner at the Livingston Group and former head of the Foreign Commercial Service in the time of Ron Brown. But during those times, I think that it was important that we learn a few lessons and we look at some opportunities. And I will just state uh, regarding uh, ambassadors, um, Ambassador Carson's statement about the $200,000 more to the State Department, that I think that we need to stay in our own lanes to make sure that we follow up to the summit, and that when you talk about worrying about commercial attaches being eliminated, the reason is because of lack of budget. And if we have agencies duplicating each other's efforts, state does economics, commerce does commercial and business. So those funds and the future of being able to follow up effectively and keep people in place and have resources have to do, I think, with agencies coordinating better and staying in their own lanes. Thank you very much. And the last question from the gentleman here. Yes, my name is Jean-Paul. I'm French. I'm a pilot for Rockwell Collins. Uh, it is... Uh, uh, hard to imagine that we are actually sitting here again, uh, knowing that every time the United States renew, try to renew the effort in Africa, it's always seemed like because there are some other entities with, with the same interest in Africa. In the Cold War, it was Russia, and in this case, here is the Chinese. So, and then when the the, the wall of Berlin fell in '89, uh, the uh, the United States pretty much withdrew from Africa altogether. So why now? I think we dismissed that question earlier a little bit too quick and too soon. So why just now? What is going to be different? Right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I'll turn to the panel. Uh, they're not going to be able to do justice to all of the um, excellent questions and comments we've, we've heard, but I could assure you that um, those have all been recorded and they will be um, forwarded for con consideration. I'll just ask the panelists to give their final comments and um, respond to any one specific issue that was raised. I'll start with you, Dr. Miyangwa. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm going to comment on the issue of inclusiveness. I have heard this come out in any number of um, the comments and questions that all of you have raised. And I think a part of moving forward has to do with conducting that after action review. And what I'm hearing from all of you is that we need to do better on the inclusiveness side, both in terms of uh, determining the agenda for future summits, but also the participation in uh, official summit events, and finally in implementation of uh, the summit commitments. And so I think this is a big takeaway. And we saw, we've seen how there has been talk about civil society could have been better included in this process rather than participating in just the side events. We've talked about youth participation. We've also talked very broadly about the rather poor media coverage of the summit in this country, but 
my brother here raised the key point about the differentials in terms of black media access to the summit and overall media access. Those are important issues to do with inclusiveness that we should look at moving forward because unless we're more inclusive in this process, we undermine our own ability to achieve the goals that we are looking to achieve. And so I will stop right there. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, yeah, th th thank you very much. I I'll, I'll make a very brief comment. Uh, I've been in this town with this policy uh, think tank committed for five years. And I just, and I, we engage the US Congress a lot. And the US Congress works in very mysterious ways. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and on the, on the export import bank, uh, it's very, uh, it really worries me because the export import bank is a money making entity. Uh, it does make money. And uh, when, uh, you know, this legislation has to go through a lot of this discussion, you get worried. And it, it does, I think that's something that uh, needs to be brought home, that this is an important institution and will support uh, a lot of these commitments that the U.S. Uh, is making. So it, it doesn't make sense to me. It's not a budgetary uh, negative uh, for the U.S. Uh, I could talk a lot about this issue. I, on the French, I don't want to say anything. I think it's a, I, I think it's a vacuum by the Africans, not a problem with the EU. If, if France is coming all the way to, to CFA, uh, to Central African Republic to rescue us, and uh, in Mali, you know, where is the EU? Uh, what's happening with our own, you know, internal peacekeeping um, uh, strategies? And that's why I think part of what came out from the summit about a peacekeeping uh, forces is important. But I will not necessarily bring, the, of course, there is, there is there a lot of work has been done looking at British colonies and French tyrannies and looking at what came out. And there's a big difference. I'll make one point on climate change, which again, I, I disagree a lot with uh, a lot of people and that's probably uh, our job. I actually have been questioning about how we approach even uh, the energy uh, initiatives. Clean energy is very good and, uh, and it's been an emphasis. Now, there's a lot of investment going to these alternatives. But then, if you look at the, the, our contribution to greenhouse gases, uh, for hydrocarbons, is extremely minute. If you compare for what even one state in the US produces uh, of, of greenhouse gases. And this uh, coal, I'm talking about coal, oil-based energy. And we are told not to focus on those. Yet, look at the discoveries in natural resources in Africa the last 10 years. This is what we got. So to me, we move on to the clean energy, that's fine. But uh, I would like us to do a bit more pollution. It's the cost of, uh, uh, well, this is, I mean, let's do the costs. Let's do the math. I am not convinced that uh, we should be discouraged from developing what we have. So I am not all for swinging that we do solar, you know, I mean, with energy. Combine these things. Um, I, I, I will try to speak to the um, two questions about the diaspora and also the religious community because they, they, they all touch on, again, constituency. Um, the mysterious workings of the U.S. Congress, one of the things that you do understand and we all understand is it's votes. It's, it's, it's people making members of Congress stop and say, oh, let me think about that. Or, hmm, maybe I shouldn't support this bill, or I shouldn't support this cut, or maybe I should actually introduce some legislation to increase funding. Um, that all depends on not only Africans and African Americans and the religious community mobilizing but working together to actually become a block of voting constituents that actually push Congress to do the right thing. Congress has no inherent bias or interest either for or against Africa. Their primary focus is the United States. That's what we have to accept. And neither does the administration. We may be looking at the end of a very Africa-focused policy with the end of the Obama administration, and then we'll all be looking at each other wondering, what the hell do we do now? So we, 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 need, we, we, can't, we can't rely on anyone to do this um, instinctively. They need to be 
encouraged to listen to their better angels. But that also means that we need to encourage our allies and our partners in Africa to also do the right thing. You can't do one without the other, or else they undermine each other. So the religious community and the African diaspora were, have been critical on many things. The religious community were at the forefront of mobilizing the United States in the HIV AIDS struggle. You may remember that. They pushed the Bush administration to actually invest in, in um, the, uh, the HIV AIDS programs that are credited with doing so much. We now face Ebola. That community is going to be essential in that response also, as is the African diaspora, because it's going to take African diaspora people to talk to their relatives and their family members and say, this is serious, this is not something from the outside, you have to start working together to start to address this. So I, I will just end by saying that mobilize, mobilize, follow up, follow up. The, the, the summit, for all of its flaws that we may have critiqued and all of the, the successes we are celebrating was the first step. If we don't take the next steps, We'll all be sitting here in 20 years, one having another conference about and saying, well, well, what have we done? And that would be the real disaster. Um, thank you very much um, for those comments. But I just have one quick question for the, um, the panelists. We can't have the think tanks here without having some discord, right? Um, the a comment you made, um, Mr. Akwe, about um, the summit being historic in nature but not in content. Uh, I was wondering whether or not the other two panelists agreed or disagreed with that. Uh, okay, so... Uh, <laughs> go on, go on. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, the content, uh, I don't think that... Uh, um, I don't think that question necessarily means that the relevance of the of the uh, of the event should be minimized because what what's the key is is this summit focusing on African development priorities is it leading to improvement on the quality of lives strategies can be different so to me uh, the content can be the same because the end goal is what we are looking at if the end goal is accepted by China by EU and all that the question is what are the strategies that get you there so I would say that. Uh, the content can be the same, but strategies do matter, and the, the, the people involved. So I, I think there's a difference, even though the, the content may, may be in harmony with others. And I, I think that uh, having harmony in terms of uh, development outcomes is important, so we don't go to different parts. Yeah. No, I, I think for me, I actually agree with uh, what Adate said in, in the sense that there was a tremendous amount of continuity if you look at uh, the actual substance of um, the commitments that came out of the summit. I think that the key difference for me was in the packaging and the focusing on specific priority uh, areas. I think that's where I saw the, the key difference in terms of how we approached our engagement with Africa this time. Um, but like the other two have said, and everybody else has said here, is that the, the, the proof will be in the actual deliverables. Are we able to deliver on these commitments? That's what we must focus on now. And um, Mr. Akwe, uh, what content would you have liked to have seen that would have made it historic? It would have been amazing to have had a conference that had African heads of state sitting next to African civil society and talking to each other. We have better success having heads of states talking to US officials and civil society talking to US officials than we do having them talk to each other. That, that would have been historic. Uh, thank you. Um, as you could see, there's quite a number of um, issues that um, have been raised. And um, I think the, um, it's, not an, it's, an, it's not so much a matter of the jury being out on this one. I think what the message I think that seems to resonate is that we really do have to work together to make sure that the, um, all the goodwill all the great ideas, all the um, laudable initiatives that we have discussed and we've launched and that we have publicized, I think now is a time to uh, make sure that those translate into actual action. 
to summarize, I think that um, what seems to have come out, not just in the post-summit um, commentary, but during um, this particular panel, is that we have to think differently. We have to think differently about Africa. We have to think differently about um, US-Africa relationships. And we also have to di think deeply differently about how we are organized to meet the goals that we have set out. And I think we have to think differently in three important ways. Uh, firstly, we have to be thinking deeply. I think there's been a lot of uh, superficial discussions about um, where Africa is going, what Africa needs. I think we have to deepen the analysis because Africa, de I think Africa um, deserves a lot better than superficial analysis. And in that analysis, in the analytical context, we also have to not rush to dismissing things too quickly. Um, and we have to consider all options. Secondly, I think we have to think creatively. We are way too accustomed to using yesterday's solutions to answer tomorrow's questions. And the questions that are facing the African continent and African countries tomorrow um, require fresh thinking, require innovative thinking. And I think that it behooves us to use this strategic opportunity to position the African continent so that we could think creatively and accomplish these goals. And thirdly, we need to think proactively. Um, a lot of what we have done in the think tank and scholarly community and what the policy folk do is re respond and we react. We're not as proactive as we should be in our thinking. We need to think deeply, creatively, and proactively to ensure that we're able to translate the goodwill, the initiatives into action that is meaningful to each and every African citizen. It remains for me to thank an excellent panel, Dr. Muyangwa, Mr. Mienwi, and Mr. Akwe for their excellent contributions. Thank you, um, the audience, for your great participation, and also thank um, Congresswoman Bass and staff for bringing us all together. Thank you. <laughs>